Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth, interactive study of the Word of God. This is an amazing series on how to interpret the Bible. I'm excited today because we're going to go back to beginnings and see how important an understanding of the Scriptures is to our origin and what happened in the early years of the history of planet Earth. So I'm glad you're with us, and I'm particularly excited that Trisha Lee is going to be teaching today. And we've got a great team. And we're glad you're part of our Hope Sabbath School family. So thanks for writing to us. Here are just a few emails, but write to us at shope at hopetv.org. We'd love to hear from you wherever you are. We know of 226 countries where people are watching the program. Amen. That's a lot of people, isn't it? Some people say, I didn't know there were even that many countries in the world. Well, one of them is Rwanda, and Joel writes, and he says, as we are waiting for the glorious return of Jesus, I would like to express my gratitude to Hope Channel for the good job you're doing with Hope Sabbath School. Amen. I use the study since I discovered Hope Sabbath School, and I have been going through the different lessons on YouTube, and they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I, in August of 2019, I visited one country where I couldn't find a single church to gather and worship on Sabbath due to the constitution of that country. But I found Hope Channel. <laughs> and that was my Sabbath in my room. Keep spreading the good news and pray for people who do not have freedom to worship. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Well, Joel, thanks for sharing with us from the country of Rwanda. Here's a note from Johnny in Scotland. Maybe I should put on a Scottish accent. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings to you from Dundee City in Scotland. I want to thank all of you for impacting many lives around the world through Hope Sabbath School. I try not to miss your in-depth interactive Bible study each week. May God richly bless you and the beautiful families in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 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 I'd like to meet Johnny. Please keep up this amazing work for God. Well, Johnny, thanks for writing to us from Scotland. And it's good to know that you're a witness for Christ there. Here's a note from a donor in the U.S. It simply says, I continue to enjoy Hope Sabbath School classes. May God bless you and all the Hope Channel team and a gift of $200 to help Hope Sabbath School. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. We're all part of a great miracle, donor-supported ministry. Thanks for being part of that ministry a donor here in the United States. Here's a note from Meshach in Zambia. Lots of Hope Sabbath School members in Zambia. Someone said, I think we have a million just in Zambia. <laughs> How are you, beloved of God? Hope Sabbath School studies inspire me ever since I started watching them. And I regret missing a single lesson. May the good Lord continue blessing you as we wait for the coming of Jesus. Do you notice that message over and over again? Mm -hmm. These lessons have helped me broaden my understanding of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. How I pray the good Lord continues using you so that when all is said and done, we can all meet before the throne of God. Amen. Hosanna in the highest. God bless you. Well, Meshach, thanks for writing to us from Zambia. And here's one I think is the first. Every once in a while we say, I don't think I've got one from the island of Rota. Where is the island of Rota, Marcus? Do you know? I don't know. It's somewhere in the sea, right? Because it's yeah, an right. island. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one's awesome. It is part of the northern Marianas Islands. Oh. The closest, yeah. uh, the largest island in that grouping is Saipan. It is known as the Friendly Island. I had to Google that. <laughs> it's a part of, it's a U.S. Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands. Rotas, population 3,283 in 2000. So there may be 3,500, who knows? But it's a small island, and someone's watching Hope Sabbath School there. Amen. Actually, that's not true. There's a whole group of people watching Hope Sabbath School, but Jotham writes to us and he says, I'm part of a church in the northern Marianas Islands called Rota. I just want to say we watch Hope Sabbath School every Sabbath here at our church. <laughs> I really like your scripture songs. 
I wish I could donate something to you, but I'm only 12 years old. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for everything, Jotham. Well, Jotham, thanks for writing to us. Would you give our greetings to the Hope Sabbath School team there on the island of Rota? And we're glad they're part of our family, aren't we? Amen. Thanks so much for being with us today. And we have a song, Jotham. We need you to help us sing. How old was he? Twelve. Just twelve, 12 years old. That's how old Jesus was when he began to understand his mission. So we're praying that we can sing together our theme song now, Let the Word of Christ Dwell in You. Let's sing it together. As I was singing, I was thinking, you sound beautiful, but even more beautiful is the fact that Jotham on the island of Rota in the <laughs> northern Marianas Islands with a group of people are singing along the Word of God mm -hmm. together Amen. with us. Amen? Amen. Amen? Well, it's going to be a great study, Trisha Lee. Let's pray and get started. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you for the journey that you've taken us on to discover truth about who you are. May we discover marvelous things from your word mm -hmm. through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Mm. Amen. 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 We are continuing a study on how to interpret the Bible. And today we're going to go right to the beginning. We're going to look at Genesis. And we're going to study together what we can learn and discover about who we are, who God is, mm -hmm. and why we worship him as creator. Amen. Amen. And so let's get right to it. The book of Genesis, who wrote it? Moses. Moses. Moses wrote it. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. It's important to have a record of what happened in the beginning, but was Moses there at the beginning? No. no. How was he able to write this account in Genesis? Right. Divine revelation. Divine, Divine revelation. What do we know about the life of Moses, Jason? We know that there are several different experiences during his life, both uh, early, middle, and late, where he had specific encounters with God, uh, both verbally and kind of experientially. Right. Mm. So it was revealed to Moses by God himself. Yeah. So an account we can trust mm. and one that we can have confidence in, Travis? I would also like to say um, that he wasn't that many generations removed, you know, so there was some, some 
um, stories handed down, I'm sure, you know, that, uh, that he could uh, base his um, writings on. Amen, amen. Let's start right at the beginning of the book. And Marcus, would you read for us Genesis chapter 1, verse 1? Sure. Genesis 1, verse 1, and I'll be reading from the King James Version. It reads, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, so what important question is answered in the very first sentence of the Bible, Gladys? It says, in the beginning, God created. Mm. So it, it doesn't give any room for any other, uh, any other interpretation. So before we existed, there is? God. 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 Yeah. Shana? Um, it answers who, when, and what, what? he did. <laughs> okay, so the who is? God. Okay, the what is? Mm. The he created. 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 All right. And when? Beginning. In, the beginning. In the beginning. All right. What other scriptures give us this bold, bold premise, this bold assertion that God, before everything we see, existed and created us? Any other scriptures we can think of? Think, think about John 1. one. Mm. Let's yeah. turn there. John chapter 1 in the first three verses. Laurel, would you please read those for us? All right. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Hmm. Amen, amen. If we keep reading a little later, we'll hear that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We understand mm -hmm. that is Jesus Christ. Yep. Mm -hmm. But let's flip over to Hebrews. Let's read in Hebrews chapter 1. We'll look at the first two verses of that. And there's another record. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. I'll ask Gladys to read that for us. Sure. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the past, God has spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. Mm -hmm. And through whom he made the universe. What difference does it make for us to know that we were created by God? What difference does that make, Addison? Oh, it gives us so much meaning and purpose. Yeah. Meaning in life, and purpose. That we're not here by chance. We're not mm -hmm. here by chance, Travis. It gives uh, each person that understands this value. Every person is valuable when you understand that you mm -hmm. have a Creator. Mm -hmm. Amen. A powerful God who existed before time as we know it, who chose to make us, yeah. mm -hmm. and later as we read the Word of God, also loves us. What else difference does it make for our lives today, Kim? Um, Knowing that God is my creator and created me at this specific point in, in my life, like I could have been born in the 1600s, but no, he wanted me here today for a specific purpose. Mm -hmm. amen, 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 amen. Sumiso. I, I think about when I work with my boss, he has about 40 years of experience in mm -hmm. what he does, and every time I go to him for advice, I just have my mind open. Mm. And I'm looking at the creator who, <laughs> in the beginning, like way before anything uh, ever existed. Uh, so what problem can I have uh, that's too much for him to mm. Mm. We've been learning in this study that the word of God is inspired by God himself. Mm. It's our manual to live, right? Yes. And so what better source mm. to understand how to live our lives than the creator God himself? Shana. Um, it's like the idea of, um, something that's handmade versus mass produced mm. the thing that's handmade is more valuable mm. and like because it was there was more thought put into it versus like just mass produced it's like cheap i love it handmade let's take a closer look at how this happened now it's beyond our comprehension to understand how god can create all that we see around us mm -hmm. from nothing mm -hmm but he did. Yeah. <laughs> but let's see how this happened, in what time period this took place. Let's continue reading in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 5. And I'm going to ask Jason if you'd read those verses for us. I'll be reading here from the New King James Version, Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. 
And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Mm. Amen. Mm. So we know that we're told on this first day, God makes what? Light. 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 He makes light. And we understand when you continue reading in the first chapter of Genesis, day by day, something else is added to this beautiful picture of yeah. earth that God is creating. Yeah. But how do we know that these are literal 24-hour days? Mm -hmm. How do we know that it took God one, two, three, four, five, six days to create the earth? Let's take a look over in the book of Exodus, mm -hmm. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. Again, we are hearing words that God spoke to Moses who wrote these accounts, who also shared with us. So we're looking at the 10th commandment, in the 10 commandments, at the fourth commandment specifically. And Kim, would you please read those verses for us? Sure, I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Exodus 20, verses eight through 10. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. Amen. 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 So we're looking at the fourth commandment and it's reference, referencing back to creation. It's telling us to remember the Sabbath day because God created the earth and created us. But what specific elements do we see? What information is in that fourth commandment that helps us to understand that that creation week, those creation days were literal 24 hour days. It might be helpful for Kim to read verse 11. Mm -hmm. Ah, because keep reading. it specifically <laughs> talks yeah. about that. Exodus 20 verse 11. Sure. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Amen. So we're looking specifically at the fourth commandment. God referring back to creation. What information in that verse, in those verses we just read, let us understand that those days of creation were literal 24-hour days. Gladys. Oh, it says very clearly there in, in verse 9, it says six days you shall labor and do your work. If it mm. was that Lip, uh, you know, little, then we will be working for six years or what? <laughs> six centuries? <laughs> Good point, Marcus. And, and in verse 11 as well, it says right there, for in six days the Lord made heaven, the earth, the sea, mm. and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. And I want to just point out one other thing about this. This is where the seal of God is referred to. This is the only place in the Ten Commandments. And the seal is because it says his name, okay. the Lord, that mm -hmm. God, and then it says the jurisdiction, heaven and earth, uh -huh. the sea and all that in them mm -hmm. is. So that's an interesting point as well, that in the middle of the Ten Commandments is God's seal of, of who he is who is the author of all? Amen. And Sabbath is important for that reason, Eric. And it confirms uh, what it says in the in the first chapter that you know in our, in our literal days and the days that we have and maybe for there are some distinctions differences in some uh, some different areas of the world, but a day starts you know there is an evening and then then there is a morning. Mm -hmm. Right. We just mm -hmm. read that the evening and the morning was the first oh, day. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also I want to prefer in the beginning. Mm. So in Genesis, we read uh, Genesis 1 for the version, New King James Version. Uh -huh. I'm reading here verse hmm, 5 because he created the first day. Let's said, turn there. Let's turn there. Genesis 1 verse 5. Yes. And say, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Yep. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Amen, yeah. amen. So there are people who believe that all that we see around us is just so complex. So it would be impossible for these things to just come into existence in only 24 hours. Some people believe that this must be, maybe it represents a millennia, or thousands or thousands of years. But how could God ask us to keep a day holy if it's not a day? How, could we, how long would we have to rest for? How long would we have to work for? Sometimes there are things that are hard for us to understand, 
But when God says he is God, yeah. and when he says he is the creator, that means he existed before us. There are things that he does that might not make sense to us, but that's what makes him God. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm thinking if he can create anything, yes, he can create it in any amount of time. Amen. Yes. Yes. Amen. That's part of being a great and awesome God. Amen. And we see it even in the ministry of Jesus. Sometimes he heals people instantly, and other times he has them go and wash in a pool or something. Yeah. The miracle is still there. And if, if he can, by the power of God, perform that miracle... He can choose to mm -hmm. perform like creation in any amount of time that, that he determines. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We're told that God created everything we see around us in six literal days. Mm. Praise God. He's Amen. powerful. Amen. But let's pause for a moment and let's talk about what we know from science today. Contemporary science tells us that the earth is billions of years old, mm -hmm. that life uh, evolved maybe millions of years ago, and that there was a long, huge evolutionary process that has taken place. And a lot of that is justified by a process called carbon dating. Um, does anyone know what that is or can briefly explain what that is? Carbon dating, semi so. I think it's, it's a scientific uh, method of determining the age of things. And in my opinion, I don't think there's a contradiction per se with that aspect of science because they, they do determine some matter is six billion years old, et cetera. But the Bible says the earth was without form and void. So if any matter that pre-existed the creation of the earth as we know it is taken and dated, mm -hmm. it could be that old. Uh, so I don't think there's really a conflict between science and, but again, uh, I'm not the authority on this, and I think <laughs> these are some of the things where we look forward to having and asking God. I had a friend who did, did a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Stanford, and they were studying about genetics, and the evolutionist explained how some of these genes that you could see, that those were remnants from the process. Mm. Well, that's, an, that's one explanation, and these are obviously intelligent women, intelligent men who sure. are thinking through. Mm -hmm. But if you start with a presupposition that there's no God, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you have to come up with some explanation right, right. Mm -hmm. yes. why we're here. Right. Mm -hmm. And that takes faith because they weren't there either. Right? <laughs> right? True. It's true. It's true. true. So we choose to say, no, the Bible boldly declares, and Jesus, when he came, Son of God, came into humanity, boldly affirmed the creation account as taught right. in the yeah. Bible, yeah. Yes. that we have a lot of questions too, yeah. right? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And right. This, this man said to me, um, godly man, bright bright mind, he said, I have some questions I'm going to ask the Creator yeah. Yeah. Amen. when we see Him. Yes. Amen. Right? right? Yeah. Because our minds are fairly limited. Yeah. Amen. Yes. But, Amen. Uh, but the, the Scripture gives a bold declaration of, of the origin of human life. Amen. Amen. Science is always based on assumptions. And when we think about yeah. carbon dating as a technique, it is based on the premise that when a living organism passes away, the amount of radioactive carbon will decay at a certain rate that tells you how old right. that creature has yeah. been. But there are many assumptions about how old the Earth might have been, about magnetism on the Earth, about all sorts of things that if you assume that the Earth is billions of years old, everything else after that doesn't really hold up. So for example, there are living organisms, freshwater clams, that have been carbon dated 2,000 years old. It's not possible, because we're looking at them right now. Mm -hmm. You can even carbon date a dinosaur bone. That are, these are supposed to be billions of millions of years old. And so, once again, when you start off with one assumption, and you want that to hold true, it doesn't quite work out. And so, even science takes faith, a measure of faith. But when we look at what God tells us, that he is powerful, he is the creator of God, he made in six days, mm -hmm then we must believe that. Amen. So let's, let's think, so what, um, what, what else did God create? This is an interesting question. What else did God create after the six days? Let's think about this. Something about the seventh day. <laughs> Something about the seventh day. Something about the seventh day. Let us look at Genesis. We're going to flip over to Genesis chapter 2 because there's something very special that God creates when he's finished creating all that we see and all of us. I will ask Laurel to read for us Genesis chapter um, 2, verses 1 through 3. All right. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Thus the heavens and the earth were complete, and all their hosts. 
By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Mm -hmm. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Amen. Amen. So, was God tired? <laughs> no. Why did he rest? What does that mean, he rested? What does that mean? That's what it says. Right. Yes. Travis. I think that he was um, sitting back and just enjoying what he mm. created, this masterpiece. Yeah. That's mm. what I believe was happening then. Okay, Samiso? I think that there's an object lessons, like we, we are created, then the first thing we do is rest. And, and, and when you look in the Bible, when it's talking about the Sabbath, it says you are I am your God that sanctifies you. Mm. So the concept of justification by faith starts earlier on in the Bible and it's enlarged and enlarged. It says you're created, the first thing you're doing is resting in His grace. Beautiful, beautiful. Instead of working your way to. Let's read that very verse. Let's turn over to Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. And while we're turning there, let's consider this. God is God all by Himself. He needs nothing. So if He's creating something extra, if he's creating the Sabbath, it can't be for him. Hmm. It must be for us. Yep. That rest must be for us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, would you please read for us Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12? Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12, reading from the New Living Translation. It says, And I gave them my Sabbath day of rest as a sign between them and me. It was to remind them that I am the Lord who had set them apart to be holy. Amen. Amen. Marcus, you touched on this earlier, the Sabbath being a sign. God gave us this beautiful gift to rest. And in my version, it says a sign that he is the Lord who sanctifies us, mm -hmm. who makes us holy. A little later on, we're going to find out that after this beautiful creation was created, we're all living in the, the result of sin, that we need the Sabbath not just to spend time with God, but for him to recreate mm, in amen. us yeah. the amen. ideal amen. image of what he wants. Amen. for us to experience a beautiful, uh, saving relationship with Him. Um, but some people believe that Sabbath is something that was really just an uh, old tradition, um, an old tradition maybe just for ancient Hebrews or something that is not to be um, recognized by modern Christians, believers and followers of Jesus. But that is not the case. <laughs> Let's go over to the New Testament. Let's see some of what Jesus Himself said about the Sabbath day. Let's turn to Mark chapter 2, verses 27. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. I am going to ask Archie if he would read that verse for us. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, And he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Let's look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. And, and may I just... Pause and say, first of all, you confirmed that, that God didn't need the Sabbath. We did. Yes. Mm -hmm. But also, it doesn't say the Sabbath was made for the Jews, no. <laughs> right? which is what some people say. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's made yeah. for the human family. Yes. And long before Abraham, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, right. God's people were taught from the very beginning mm -hmm. yes. to remember each week God is their creator. And, mm -hmm. and, and these also active in their lives. There's the one who sanctifies them. There is Amen. something good and blessed about the Sabbath that we can all benefit from. Mm. Addison, would you read for us Matthew chapter 12, verse 11 and 12? Sure. Well, just give me a moment. To... We're going to Matthew chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. We're continuing right. to see what Jesus himself said about this special day. Yes. And I'm reading from the King James Version. And he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Amen. 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 So this was in context to some of the religious leaders at the time questioning and challenging Jesus about how he was keeping that day. At that time, they believed the Sabbath was a time to do nothing to literally rest by doing nothing, or at least uh, severely limiting what you were doing or only focusing on religious rites and rituals. But God 
is showing us that it's also a time not just to be blessed by God spiritually, but it is also a time that we can let those blessings flow mm -hmm. from us mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. And in that context, yeah. Jesus was talking about healing, mm -hmm. healing and restoring. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath is also important to us when we think about um, the great controversy, the, e, the um, universal battle between good and evil. It's mentioned in the book of Revelation, so it's mentioned right at the beginning when God created it, but there's also a reference to it, and we'll, we'll, we'll dig it out of this verse. There's a reference to it at the end of the story as well. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. And I want us to read this verse and think about how is the Sabbath important to us as believers at the end of Earth's history. I'm going to ask Tanya to read for us Revelation 14, verse 7. I will read for the version New King James, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Mm. Amen. Amen. It doesn't say Sabbath, but how do we know what is important? What's the significance of Sabbath in this particular message that says to worship God the Creator? Any thoughts here, Travis? Well, it just says worship Him who made the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And so there's a direct reference to the, to the fourth commandment. Right. It's a direct reference. Mm -hmm. Think about it. In a time when people are questioning whether God is truly God, whether He exists, mm -hmm. they're questioning, did He really create us? They're questioning, does He deserve to be worshipped? Mm -hmm. When we honor His seventh day Sabbath, we are showing that we believe God is Creator. Mm -hmm. We believe yeah. He created in six literal days and made this seventh day for us to honor. And we're showing that we believe that he is worthy of our praise. Mm. And so even without saying that word Sabbath, we are giving God glory when we honor him by worshiping on that day mm -hmm. and yeah. acknowledging him as creator mm -hmm. of all. Travis. And, and, and in that, um, we just referenced it earlier, as we recognize in the Sabbath that we have value because we have somebody who thought well of us enough that he would create us specifically, as was talked about before, detailed took you the time to mold and shape each and every one of us. Amen, yeah. amen. You talked about Jesus and the Sabbath doing good and it was made for the whole human family. Uh, it also tells us in Luke 4 that, that he remembered the Sabbath day. Amen. That, that was, amen. And it's interesting, it says as his practice or his custom was. Yeah. But there were many non-biblical practices that he dispensed with. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, they yeah. criticized yeah. him. Yeah. But he says, you, you put your traditions above the commandments of God. But when it comes to the Sabbath, he doesn't dispose of the Sabbath. What he challenges is the way they had distorted the true meaning of the Sabbath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's, he's remembering the Sabbath, it says, Luke 4, 16, every Sabbath. But he challenges right. their distortion. Because actually, the Sabbath was given for our blessing yes. Yes. Yeah. and for our healing. And, uh, and that's a beautiful truth that I think many need to understand. Amen, mm. amen. And Aaron. to add on to, her, to that, um, just going back to Mark uh, chapter 2, verse 27, my, my version says, the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of the people mm. Mm. and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Amen. Just a confirmation of what he just shared. A beautiful yeah. gift. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to Genesis because there's another <laughs> gift that God gives us. And remember, we're thinking about what do we learn about the foundations of who we are, who God is, why we worship Him. He gave us the Sabbath as a gift, but He also gave Adam and Eve something very special too. He gave them marriage. Let's read a series of verses and let's see what we can understand. There is something important about the character of God. We were made in His image, we're told. There's something important about the character of God that's reflected in family life. That's reflected in the bond between a husband and a wife. Mm. That's reflected in the way we interact with each other. And that's under attack today. Mm. But let's see what we can learn about what God originally instituted, mm. the, the second gift mm. that he gave Adam and Eve. Let's read a series of verses. I'm going to ask Kim if you read for us Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 28. I will ask Gladys to then read Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And then I will ask Samiso to continue reading Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. So we'll begin with you. 
Sure. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so God creates Adam and Eve. We understand that we are made in his image and we reflect that by being um, human, but a little bit, um, there's some differences. Men are not women, women are not men, right? So we are reflecting the image of God by being one human family, but by reflecting different characteristics, different aspects of the maleness or femaleness <laughs> that we uh, know <laughs> and experience. Whichever side you're on, you know what it's like to be a woman or a man. But, uh, what, what do you think that means about who God is? Because we, we, don't, we, we, we don't refer to him as a, as a female. We understand that we actually refer to him with a male pronoun. I think it's just how our language works. But what do you think that means about who God is, the aspect of being one family, but having different aspects of, 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 of being one? You know, it uh, uh, just struck me, uh, Trisha Lee, that it's beautiful. While God finished his creative work, the creation's not finished. Uh -huh. <laughs> and there's something beautiful about our creator saying, mm. I'm going to give you, as a human family, the privilege yeah. of participating yeah. in yeah. this amazing creation. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that you know, as the Bible will record that Adam and Eve have children, yes. that they're not going to take that, those children and go, we did this, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. They're going to say, God is an awesome creator. Mm -hmm. And yet they were participating in that. And to me, that's a, a picture of a loving God mm -hmm. who experienced joy in the creation of, of his beautiful uh, world with, with people, but then said, I want you to participate Amen. In the creation. Amen. That's Amen. Beautiful. It's a gift. Marcus, any thoughts on what do we see or understand about God in creating male and female? Well, first of all, when a child is born, they see their parents. And so by seeing their parents who are one because of marriage, they see different aspects of God's character. Maybe in the, in the, in the father, maybe a little bit more uh, direct, maybe a little bit more bold, or, or sometimes even could be harsh. And in the mother, maybe a little bit softer, maybe a little bit more tender, maybe a little bit more uh, nurturing. Those are different aspects and, of God's character that are revealed through the parents. So the child sees the image of God reflected in his or her parents. And that is how God is able to give humankind participation in, cre in creation. Beautiful. So mm. certainly there are things about God that we just don't understand. Mm. Mm. True. And we will discover more when we are, you know, reunited face to face, mm. you know, mm -hmm. when he returns at his second coming. But sometimes I like to think about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, different and distinct and yet one. Mm -hmm. um, but there will certainly be more that we have to understand. Gladys, would you continue reading for us? Yes, I'm reading from the New International Version, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Mm. Okay, uh, it's not good. So far, if you read through Genesis chapter 1, everything is good and very good. Everything mm -hmm. is perfect. And here we're told it's not good that Adam was by himself. God <laughs> had a special plan. For Adam and Eve, she didn't realize it yet because she wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a special plan coming. Sami, so please continue reading for us. Genesis 2, verse 21 to 24. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, So the Lord caused the man to fall into deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Mm -hmm. For this reason, 
a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, mm -hmm. and they will become one flesh. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. They will become one flesh, and they are able to participate in that creative blessing mm -hmm. that God gave to humankind. Beautiful. But we understand that there are a variety of views today, not just today, even in Jesus' time, there are different views on the family, relationships, commitment, and what marriage really looks like. Well, let's take a view on some of Jesus' Jesus's own words on the topic. Let's look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 6. I'm going to ask Archie to read those verses for us. And again, um, as so often happened to Jesus, he's being challenged. His views are being challenged. And he's going to respond um, to those critics and challengers. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, it is, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. And he said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Amen. So here Jesus is referencing back to this creation account, saying it is still relevant. Not only is it still relevant, but God never intended for there to be division in, these, in this um, critical family unit, in the, in the marriage. He never intended for this to happen. Mm -hmm. I love that Jesus says, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Mm -hmm. And when I hear that, I think about all the different ways that we try to separate marriage. Mm -hmm. Some people say it's not relevant. I can just live with someone and love them and still show that I care or that it's not for me, I don't need to be a part of this, or that families can somehow look different than what God intended. Mm. And here we see, we've read two accounts of Jesus upholding the Sabbath, it is still relevant. Mm. Upholding the family mm. structure and the family unit, mm. it is still relevant. Mm. Just like back in um, Eden, we'll, we'll read soon that um, our first parents were given the power to choose. Mm -hmm. And today we have the power to choose whether to follow God's ideal for us or not. But truly, we can see that when we follow God's plan, things end up well, not just for us, but even for societies. Mm -hmm. Families as the backbone for society, mm -hmm. loving each other as God intended. Mm -hmm. I think the key there, as, as was read, what God has joined together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I remember hearing someone's uh, marriage vow, I promise to be faithful to you as long as I love you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you go... Uh, that person wasn't claiming to be a Christian. That was just their vow. And when they got tired, they'd move on. So I think mm. to experience mm. the, the fulfillment and the security of a marriage relationship as God intended, you ask God to join those Amen. two lives Amen. together. Amen. Amen. And you keep God at the center, Amen. right? Amen. You keep God at the center because, you know, even think of Adam and Eve. They had some rough days. Yeah. You know, they faced challenges and, and, yeah. and they had to say, God, fill us with your love, because they could have had a reason to say, I think I'd rather live by myself. <laughs> but marriage is keeping God at the center, asking Amen. his love to be at the center. Amen. Amen. Quickly, what would you say to someone that views traditional marriage as out of date, old-fashioned, unnecessary? What advice would you give to them? Hmm. I'm going to look at some of our married individuals. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me so. You should be the first Raising your hand. <laughs> Gladys. Well, my father always says that the marriage is part of God's pure, uh, mm. transformation ah. system. <laughs> get to, to really get to, to the level of living with a person that, that you just become your better self and your worse self at the same time. And if Christ is in the center, you are both uplifted into another dimension that you will not be able to learn it any other way. Hmm. All right, Jason. I would say let the evidence speak for itself. You have a lot of different types of marriage, and just look at society and see which ones are better for families, for children, which ones produce better outcome. There's, there's no you know, perfect marriage, but if you just look at the evidence, you can see which ones are better overall. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise God. So, so far, looking at Genesis, 
we have received, um, we're looking at one way that we can relate to God, the Sabbath, a time to dedicate to building and strengthening our relationship with him. We also see the gift of marriage, mm. an opportunity to build and strengthen families, how we relate to each other. It's interesting, right at the start of the book, God is giving us a blueprint on how to love him and how to love mm. each other. Yes. Amen. Um, but something goes terribly wrong. Mm. Something goes terribly wrong. We are all living the, in the effects of that. And, and Genesis also tells us where did sin come from? How did it enter the world? And this is important because many people who um, are critical of the Christian view or critical of God, they struggle trying to understand how could a loving God allow all this sin, hurt, and pain? Mm -hmm. Let's go right back to the source of the account and let's read what we learn about um, the or at least uh, the how sin entered the world. I'm going to ask Laurel to read for us Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. All right. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat up from the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they, sewed, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Hmm. 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 Let's continue reading um, verses 9 through 21. And I will ask Travis to read those verses for us. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, and for dust you are, and dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made tunics of skin and clothed them. It's a sad story. A perfect environment changes so quickly on one decision. Eve makes a choice, then Adam makes a choice. We learn that the ground is cursed. 
We learned that both of them are cursed through toil and, and, and the pain of childbearing. Even at that moment, they couldn't really see all the results of what would happen, but we're living it today. Violence, anger, jealousies, all the terrible things, death that we associate with sin. Let's take a quick look prior to this and understand how could God allow this to happen? Mm. Jason, read for us verses uh, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. How could God allow this to happen? If he knew what was going to happen, how could he allow this to happen? I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Some people read this account and they feel as though it's like a, it's like a bad setup. Like God knew that this eating this tree would result in all the horrors that we see today, but he still puts the tree there and then tells them this command and we know what happens. How, does a, how do we understand a loving God's decision to allow this, um, I don't wanna call it an experiment, I don't wanna call it a test, but how do we understand a loving God's decision to allow this tree to exist in the middle of paradise, Gladys? God doesn't want to force us mm. to love him. Right. So if there is, everything is good and nothing will tempt you to do something different, it will be like, okay, God didn't give me a choice. Mm. Everything is about choice. He said, this is my command. This is what I want you to do. So it was a test of obedience. Mm. So if there, God, otherwise it will be like a forced service, a forced love. Okay. One of the principles we've learned in this whole series about how to interpret the Bible is you have to look at the context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, God created, and, and the Bible says in chapter 1, it was very good. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. God has not created booby traps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was very good. Mm -hmm. But as you've reinforced, Trisha Lee, he gave us freedom to choose. Because only if we ch have freedom to choose can we choose to love. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Choose to love him, choose to love each other. We have to have freedom. But remember in our study we've talked about not just the immediate context when we interpret the Bible, but the broader the context. The broader context. Mm. So you go to Genesis 22 where God tells Abraham, the Lord will provide. Amen. So, but then I have to look at the whole Bible mm -hmm. where God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I need to look at the broad context and I also need to understand, who is this really a talking snake mm. in chapter 3? Mm -hmm. Or does the Bible tell us who this... Mm -hmm enemy is who's breaking into this new creation. So I think it's a great case study of, of realizing the importance in interpreting the Bible, of, of looking at the rest of Scripture in order to come to a correct understanding of the character of God and also God's plan to rescue from this terrible tragedy. Sometimes it can feel as though maybe God's decisions feel like a booby trap or might seem arbitrary, but there is always a bigger context. Remember, in the beginning, which means God existed before there was earth, before there was us. Yeah. Yes. So we yeah. can hyperspace. Let's go over to Revelation and quickly read, quickly read. Before the earth existed, before we even came on the scene, there is the context that Pastor is talking about. Revelation chapter 12, I'm going to ask Travis to read for us quickly verses 7 through 12. There is a bigger context that demands the freedom of choice that God gives to us. Now I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame them by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives till death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. 
Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Before this earth was created, there was this war in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. This cosmic conflict between good and evil that our little planet <laughs> got caught in the middle of. Mm -hmm. But God wants us to choose what side we are on. Yeah. We have the opportunity through the revelation he's given to us, through his Holy Spirit, to choose right. There are always consequences for wrong, but God offers us hope. And even in this account we read here in Revelation chapter 12, we're told that that enemy's time is short. Mm -hmm. That enemy's time is short. Mm -hmm. As we wrap up our study, let's look back at Genesis chapter 3 and where do we see the hope there? Mm -hmm. Where do we see the hope that our first parents received? I mean, everything beautiful around them was changing mm -hmm. from that first decision to, uh, to be deceived, to follow the enemy. But where do we see the hope, Pastor? You know, you were reading here, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we have a Savior. Yes. That's the good news. There's a Savior. You go back to Genesis and it says that the Lord God clothed them mm. in tunics of skin. Mm. That was not just, you need something to wear. You can make your own thing. Mm. God is saying, even there, I will provide yeah. salvation Amen. for you. Yeah. The covering of the, the, those lambs yeah. reminds them of the Savior who's to come. Amen. And to me, that's the great story. And that's why when we interpret the Bible, we need to look at the whole picture. Amen. Because the whole picture tells us a God who loves us with an immeasurable and, mm. and unfailing love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. This is just the foundation, and there's so much more in Genesis that, we, that tells about who we are, who God is, why we worship Him as Creator, and the promise that He has to save us. So I thank you for studying with me, and I look forward to continuing the study on how to interpret Scripture. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, Trisha Lee. What a great study. Amen. Amen. You know, what an amazing thought. We're not just here by accident. You say, Derek, I still have questions. Well, I'm sure you do. And, and that's why we're going to talk to our Creator God. Uh, you might even wonder, well, how is it right that, that someone else should suffer in my place and pay for my sin? Mm. And yet God in His unfailing love says, I'll provide a way for you yes. to bring you back into fellowship with me. What an amazing God we serve. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you that you are not only the great creator God, but the great savior God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please continue to guide us as we interpret scripture that we may, as Jesus promised, be led into all truth and that we may know you, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, thanks for joining us for Hope Sabbath School. As Trisha Lee said, the journey continues. Learn how much God loves you and then go out and be a blessing to those around you.